Well, I think uh, I think we have started. Um, first of all, I would like to thank everybody who's on the other side of this uh, internet connection. Uh, to thank EGO for organizing this short course on the future of education and skills in the raw material sector. I am Manuel Regueiro, the Chief of STEM Affairs and Communication of the Geological Survey of Spain. And I will be uh, presenting this, this short course. Uh, first thing, I will uh, present uh, our speakers. Uh, the first speaker will be uh, John Luden. Uh, and together with Anna Clark, they have uh, they are going to present trends and opportunity in training uh, in the geoscience sector. John Luden is well known, at least for me, I guess for you also, because he has been the director of the British Geological Survey for some time. Uh, now he's professor of environmental governance and diplomacy in the Lyle Center of Heriot Watt University in Scotland. Uh, and as I said, he has been 13 years uh, the director of the British Geological Survey, where we got to know and discuss together about geoscience in general. Um, he is now um, the president of the International Union of Geological Science, UPS, also fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, foreign member of the Russian Academy of Science, and past president of Eurogeo Service, also hosting this short course with us and the European Geoscience Union. So he's been president almost of uh, everything in geoscience. So he, his ideas, I think, um, are very or should be uh, relevant. So I give the floor now to John Luden. John. OK, thanks very much. And I think we're good. Can you see that, Manuel? Yep. Okay. I can see you. I don't see the. the yeah, let's try a, I don't see let's, your PowerPoint yet. Let's try sharing screen again. Okay. All right. Okay, we're on. Okay. Right. Uh, thanks very much for for inviting me to give this this talk and. And also, I'd like to thank my co-author there, Anna, who helped me put it together. So, um, geoscience, what is geoscience? It's a, it's a broad collection of sciences that can solve with understanding the planet. It's a science of interpretation that can change as data availability changes. Observations need to be matched with broader understanding of processes, the cause and effects. And there's a requirement as a geologist to think in, in 4D. It's always been and still is intrinsically linked with resource exploration. There's a historic uh, association of environmental exploitation and, and damage. And while also being the science that, that, that provides the solutions, it also is the, the science that is useful in providing the environmental uh, remediation. Um, the focus of geoscience and what it is, is and what it can provide for humanity has changed over the years. And I guess one question is, has geoscience teaching and training kept pace with this? So why is training of, in geoscience crucial? Geoscience is no longer about what simply where resources are and can be found and how to extract them. Data driven, driven, driven decisions must also consider environmental, societal and political impacts. There's a, there's a research development bias towards regions with strong data coverage. And surface geological mapping, where it's not feasible, requires actually a strong, um, a strong geophysical requirement. However, often geology and geophysics are even taught as separate subjects, so geologists are not necessarily trained as, as geophysicists. We need to think bigger. We need to think about uh, bigger questions. We need to think about large data systems. So there's been a notable decline in in geoscience teaching, at least what from what we see in the UK, what we see in the States and many other countries. So the question is, you'd have thought that geology being such an interesting and exciting science, we would actually be getting the enrollments that uh, would encourage an increasing number of people. But I think probably, although we're trying to understand this trend, one might have 
consider the, the lack in enrollment or decreasing enrollment in particular in recent years may be related to the fact that geology is too intrinsically linked to industries such as uh, which are damaging the environment, oil and gas and mining and such like. Uh, we actually notice in the UK that there's a significant uptick in enrollments in geography where students think they're probably solving climate and environmental problems. So here are some trends, for example, at, uh, and um, this is sort of time against numbers of students for USA, Germany, and the UK, sorry about the UK is sort of scaled about the 40, but as you can see from 2000, 2010, 15 onwards, of the, well, since, since peak oil, there's a decrease in the uh, number of students enrolled. And in this, this diagram on the side, which actually shows how the, the training feeds into the, um, the output, actually what's, what's, what's really remarkable, and this is for the US, is how little, at least in the US, the numbers of students actually go into the mining sector. As you can see, a large number of students are focusing on the oil and gas sector. That's clearly going to change. Uh, otherwise, it's in the environment sector, which seems to be an increasingly, um, an increasingly attractive area for students. So is there a lack of awareness of application of geology to other sectors? And yeah, uh, it will be interesting to have a diagram like this for Australia, which we don't have, but where I suspect the mining sector will be larger. But nonetheless, you, you get a good feeling for, the, for where the students are going. So this is an interesting one. So what is a geologist, really? So when, when we think of a geologist, what do we see? So these are the top five images that you get when searching Google. Essentially, we have rocks, hammers, and we like outdoors. Lack of diversity. Uh, Lack of PPE or lack of uh, lack of health and safety considerations here. One might ask whether geologists are seen as perhaps as lacking common sense or and wild wild field beasts. But then then you go on and look at what a data scientist is. Again, uh, there are we teaching the students to combine the right skills? These data data scientists here are all males, right? There's a, they're indoors, a lack of diversity again. So this, this diversity problem is increasingly, or actually still a problem we have in, in geology. So um, is one question we can ask is, is this data driven science a threat to geology? Uh, you know, what's more effective, training a geoscientist in data science or, or teaching geoscience, geosciences to a data scientist? Clearly the second one is easier. Uh, so um, if the data scientists can learn enough geoscience, we can then provide sufficient solutions to geoscience problems. However, can we argue that as geoscientists well-versed in data science, we can provide the superior solutions to geoscience problems? So I think you know, this really is starting to affect our science. And um, the relevance of geoscience, right? It's, it's where traditionally teaching has centered around the trait understanding of the earth in order to better understand the distribution of the currency resources, training has undergone a shift in recent years to understanding, if you want, unsustainable practices. So traditional occupations are disappearing, loggers, interpreters, and there's a move towards uh, what we might call an augmented geoscientist who focuses on domain problems solving solutions. So providing the, stu the students with robust tools is an important uh, consideration going forward. The hub of geoscience employment is moving, is moving downstream in the resource sectors. And a quote, a recent quote from a graduate employer that I can give you here, graduate programs are producing outstanding scientists, some of the best scientists we've seen, but the problem is they don't know how to do anything. So many of the applied skills in geoscience are not found in the formal education. So how do we actually start to, to make sure that we provide the skills for scientists who are in this applied sector, mining, oil and gas, even environmental re remediation, carbon capture and storage, you know, they need, they need the skills of communication, business skills and such like. So uh, commodities, many, many commodities have 400 years of reserves, but the challenge is in pr production, distribution, and then the retirement or the, the rehabilitation and, and co-production. So geoscience is an integrated science of engineering, geophysics, geology, 
and geochemistry and many other skills. It's, it's often, often these different aspects, engineering, geophysics and geology are actually taught independently of each other. So how do you get this kind of holistic, well-trained, well-tooled geoscientist as we go forward? So probably the, one of the, the keys to all this is collaboration. Uh, you might recognize the pictures here where, where you can see sort of a, a digger bucket deep working on its own, trying to push out the, uh, the, the, the container car carrier in the Suez Canal, whereas a bunch of tugs, tugs pulling together actually help the process and, a, and collaborative efforts of, of many uh, scientists clearly help. So there's a move towards collaborative training models across industry and across academia. academia. There's a move to equip scientists with uh, their careers that they need for industry and academia, greater linkage, greater postgraduate employment and such like. So the, the examples here, these are, these are British examples, but there are other examples I think you could find. So the, the creation of the centers for doctoral training where actually these centers are co-funded by industry where the doctoral students, in this case, not undergraduate students, come out with, uh, with specialist training in, uh, as geoscientists. And there is a formal linkage between industry and academia. And I think that probably one of the solutions going forward for the mining industry will be to actually create, if not doctoral training programs, but master's training programs at least, where there's a more formal linkage and we end up with, with students who come out with a, with a combination of geology, geophysics, engineering, and the social values in geosciences. So um, this is a diagram that's, that's taken from a recent paper by uh, Edmund Nicholas and Jack Hess, which tends to show that the, the fact basically that this, it's the evolution of surveys, the evolution of, of, of geoscience institutes, tends to show that there's a shift from national exploration to international collaboration. Geology doesn't, doesn't recognize or adhere, adhere to borders and also um, under, underpins the, the importance of major data providers and the significance of continental scale geological survey formation in understanding continental scale geology. It also tends to showcase the need for data and, and in the mining sector, we still have a, a significant problem of people being somewhat selective about their data that they, that they put. In, gen, in general, if you take Africa, for example, many African countries do not release their geological data openly. So that actually is, is a hindrance to mining and such like as we go forward. So open data is an opportunity. I think, I think probably open data will help uh, us uh, move forward. It'll help us train students. It'll help bring students into the, into the discipline. It, it's an opportunity to think locally, sorry, think globally, uh, maybe act locally. It promotes multidisciplinary collaboration. It develops skill sets required. The, the slide that you have down at the bottom here that you can see is actually from the Frank Arnott Award, which, which, is, at, which is in, in uh, uh, mining technology essentially or, or mining uh, exploration that was awarded this, uh, this spring at Prospectors. In, you know, I think kind of there's something that you can see, see from this. Team Emerald, for example, is largely a Colombian team, I think. Uh, and, but yet they use the data set to underpin their model, which is based on the Yukon Plateau. Right, and so you know that you know that the, the data is not even available in Colombia for these people who are trained in Colombia to actually use a data set that's local to them. So that's a problem that we need to deal with. Um, I think that as we move towards global development, it's clear that that, that we can we can link mining uh, into the into the sustainable development goals. It, this this uh, slide here shows uh, the mitigation. Are required if you're mining, but also the uh, the enhancement. So essentially, mining does fit fairly well into all of the uh, national all, all of the uh, priority goals, in particular in terms of low poverty and partnerships and quality education and such like. But also, we need to make sure that, that when we're teaching mining or we're training people on the arm like that under under taking taking mining, we're also thinking about the direct implications of mining on life below water, hunger, gender equality and in particular artisanal sort of mining and such like. And so, you know, global, global development, uh, probably what's important there is in-demand or in-country training by local educators. 
Raw materials can provide economic basis for such programs and development is required. Um, there's, there's a potential to solve two issues with the same process of training in country, and that's the critical supply and social development, and the two need to be mutually inclusive. So uh, there's a lot of interest at the moment uh, in various people in, in mining development in Africa. There's a lot of development in Africa and, uh, and elsewhere, but uh, let's just focus on Africa for a second. The concern is that as, the, as we race towards technological metals to provide electric cars in, the, in Europe and in North America and such like, we may not necessarily consider well enough the, uh, the, the knock-on effects of the people in on the ground who are mining these resources for us. And that's a very important thing that, I know Eurogeo surveys are in, involved in programs such as pan -FGO, and that's a, the important thing there is to, is to train and, and make sure that the resource as much as we can, the development of the tertiary industries involved with that resource are also uh, done in Africa, if at all possible. So I think, you know, there's still a big question for geoscience as a whole. As, as, as there are still big questions out there, not well, and for where minerals come from, how we can find them, how we can look deeper. But in, a, in general, you know, we need to change the traditional view of a, of a, of a geologist as a a hammer-wielding, boot-wearing geologist. We need to inspire the next generation to learn skills to require to address the future geological challenges. We need to make it clear that geology and geophysics and engineering and social studies need to be combined in some way and order and this a more holistic approach. So this is a, you might have seen this is kind of a busy slide, but it's a nice one taken from uh, Global Geology for Global Development and the Geological Society, but essentially it summarizes quite nicely actually looking forward all the potential jobs in geoscience, including minerals, energy, and, uh, and such like, uh, uh, geothermal energy, waste, critical minerals, and such like, but an enormous spectrum of environmental and energy transition jobs as well as we go forward. But we're, we're not, the process, are not really doing as good a job as we should in selling how broad geoscience is, is and can be, and the opportunities in geoscience in education. So currently this decline that we're seeing in enrollment, I think certainly in this COVID year will continue to decrease. The fact that oil and gas companies are viewed as being, as, as not being necessarily the, thing, the way that places are in the future. So, you know, trying to find the right, edu the right career opportunities for geoscientists at the moment is a, is a big challenge. I think for the mining sector, the key is probably in the master's area where you actually take take fairly well-trained undergraduate students and you, and you provide specialist education potentially inside you in country in the, in the master's area and potentially start to think about building doctoral programs where you create really high quality uh, mineral exploration geoscientists who are well-trained and well-versed in geophysics, geology and, uh, and a number of social and economic aspects. So that's kind of a view from me, it's a view from uh, probably the fit that goes across geology in general, and I think is applicable to, to, uh, to the mining sector. I think, um, I think there's a good future for geosciences. I just kind of think we're going through a lull in, under, in trying to communicate it. And we, uh, we need to be careful that we don't just continue decreasing and that we actually manage to get things to pick up again. And uh, I'm not sure how to do that. It may take some clever use of geography in the future because that's where the students tend to be going. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, John. Uh, it's really surprising that uh, the spectrum of jobs uh, in geoscience is huge, but there is no demand of students. And the other thing you said that I, I want to, to remember here, because we'll talk uh, further on, is that uh, universities works on, on, on subjects, and there is a need to clarify skills, to give skills, not subjects, keep skills. And this is what we've been trying with the interim project. I'll explain that later. Thank you very much. Um, very much. We are uh, short of time again. So I have to thank John Luden and give the floor to Aurela Zitza to talk about the mineral sector perspective in education and training. Aurela Stisa, is difficult this one holds an engineering degree from the Polytechnic University of Tirana in Albania and a PhD in geology from the Katholieke Universiteit of Leuven in Belgium. 
He has been working first for uh, Arcadis and Glencore in subjects like regulatory affairs and sustainability. And then she joined uh, IMA Europe, Industrial Mineral Association of Europe in 2011. And she is now the Director of Industrial Affairs and Raw Materials in IMA. She is General Secretary of the European Specialty Minerals and oversees the policy and trade developments and preparation of the advocacy for IMA Europe. Uh, she is uh, Vice President in the Board of SPI PPP, Sustainable Processing Industries for Resource and Energy Efficiency Public Private Partnership, and SERPA in the European Innovation Partnership in Raw Materials. Um, please, Aurela, floor is yours. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Really sorry for this. I don't know what happened, but I was um, locked out and now I'm checking back in. Are you able to see my screen? Not yet. Yes, now we see it. Yep. So uh, really sorry for this IT issue. Um, first of all, thank you for uh, having me here for allowing to present the mineral sector perspective in education and training. Um, just on the presentation layout, I'll uh, briefly introduce uh, the mineral sector in a nutshell, a few key numbers and figures. Uh, the minerals, where they are being used, um, EU skills agenda, so what is going on on the policy level, and also job profile changes in the mineral sector, so how things have been changing from the past and also see a big what, what is coming our way, and also uh, summarize with a few takeaway messages. So um, EMA stands for Industrial Minerals Association and uh, EMA Europe, it is an umbrella association which represents um, 10 um, subsections which cover in fact the different uh, mineral sectors such as talc, bentonite, diatomite, crystalline, silica, lime, uh, magnesite, calcium carbonate, borates as well as kaolin and clay. So um, having said this, um, I would like just to introduce uh, that we have about 250 member companies that operate 685 mines and quarries across Europe and 700 processing plants. Uh, every year in Europe are extracted and put on the European market in different applications about 180 million tons of raw materials. Um, which is a key number. It just gives you a bit of a scale of the mineral sectors in Europe. Uh, the direct employment by the mineral sector is 42,500 direct employees um, in 28 European countries, Norway uh, as well. Um, and the turnover of the sector is around 14 billion uh, euros. When I present the, um, this different applications such as glass, steel, ceramic, paper, uh, the idea is that uh, is just to illustrate in concrete terms where our raw materials are being used. So to produce glass you have or ceramics, you have 100% minerals. To manufacture paper, you have about 50% of it is minerals. But also when you take your smartphone, we always hear about rare earth um, uh, raw materials or elements, but in fact about 60% of the weight of a telephone, it is coming from different minerals which are part of the copper, the battery, re reinforced steel, the glass as well. Um, when you think of a house or of a car, you also have uh, to consider that there are different constituents as part of a house or a car. And um, in each of these different constituents, you have uh, different uh, minerals, which in total um, make up about 150 um, 
tons of minerals are can be found in a house or in a car. Uh, it is the same uh, numbers. I'm, I'm not going to go through all the detailed numbers here, but um, also uh, infrastructure. You need a lot of raw materials in order to make it um, or to uh, keep it in uh, good conditions in order to be able to operate. So thinking about um, biking uh, tracks or rail tracks, it is the same. Um, when we think about the um, energy generation or energy infrastructure, we always uh, think about the rare earth. But in fact, in order to keep these infrastructures in place, um, if you take the windmills, for example, uh, you do not see the 50 to 50 uh, meter uh, base that keep this, this infrastructure operational. So I'd just like to bring a few concrete examples where our materials are, uh, are found. Going to the new skills agenda, um, I would like just to briefly introduce you um, uh, that uh, early middle of uh, last year, the European skills agenda for sustainable, competitive, social fairness and resilience, it was uh, it was uh, actually it was published and it is basically um, a reshaping or a revival of the 2016 skills agenda. And the key updates of it are the linkages with the European digital strategy, industrial and small and medium enterprise strategy, recovery plan for Europe, and increased support for youth employment in order to create more opportunities for the European young generation. This uh, EU skills agenda is um, based on five building blocks. The first block is to create um, collective action by mobilizing businesses, social partners, as well as stakeholders in order to create this matrix of opportunities for different concerned stakeholders to work together uh, and to uh, actually deliver on EU industrial ecosystems. The second building block of the EU agenda on skills is to define the clear strategy to ensure that skills lead to jobs. So we need to have these skills in order to create job opportunities for, um, for uh, people. Um, the, third, uh, the third building block are the people um, and the need that they need the, the people and the opportunity to develop their skills through a long life learning. Uh, the idea is that uh, it should become the new norm. So it is not once you enter in a job that you don't evolve or you don't uh, grow professionally. So the idea is to create this impetus or a motivation where people feel the added value. Uh, the fourth pillar, the fourth pillar, is to set ambitious objectives and uh, to upskill and to reskill people. So, it does not mean that you have started a certain job profile and you always have to do exactly the same. So, the idea is to create this impetus where people feel remotivated to re recreate or to uh, find something new. Um, and uh, the skills agenda has also put some financial means in place in order to um, create the investments for the skills agenda to be put in place. Having said this, I'll also go to the next um, slide, introducing a bit how the societal challenges versus labor adaptation have moved in time. And I found this very interesting graph where you have um, a nice illustration on how the generations move from the baby boomers to Gen X and millennials, and of course the Gen Z. Um, and I'd like just to illustrate a bit how the baby boomers, they were looking for a certain kind of stability. And starting from Gen X, you have the technology use, which if you see from the year 60 to the years 90 have actually doubled. And the Gen Z are the new employers of our sector or other sectors as well. And we still need to understand better what the Gen Z uh, opportunities and uh, needs are. 
Uh, starting from this past um, look, uh, we see that um, in the at the end of the Second World War, there was uh, the uh, opportunity, so there was a need for very fast growth, so the education was mainly made nearby home. Uh, there was a steady job environment and the conditions because there was this need to grow very quickly. So you had very quick job opportunities nearby. You learn at the job site and the, it was a very, very early beginning of the automation industry. So it started somehow in the Second World War and then immediately after there was the automation in uh, different industrial sectors than the automotive uh, sector. And what is very striking is that for most employees, it was one employer in a lifetime. So it was a very one-to-one -one relation. So you start in a certain company and you go to pension from that same company. What has happened if I take or if I compare with the millennials, um, the education uh, time to educate yourself has gone longer. And... Um, you can educate at home or abroad, but once you have finished one degree, you'd like to get another uh, degree, likely in another university than the first one. So you combine this with additional abroad studies. There is not a static job environment, but there is a dynamic job environment as well as job conditions. You are trained on the job site, and it is the beginning of the digitalization in different industrial sectors. And most employed change multiple jobs and sectors uh, much often. So if we analyze a bit why there is this change, of course, within the European Union, there was a certain dynamic created by the European Union per se, the Erasmus, it was mentioned, um, and a few uh, large European projects that allow this uh, mobility of students from one university or country to another one. Uh, there was more connectivity, so you get much quicker the information. Uh, there were more possibility, and the job profile description has become more and more complex. So you don't have a job profile that is only linked with one specific degree, but you need certain skills and certain abilities to adapt very quickly. So uh, the first question people will ask is why people join or what people stay in the mineral sector. Um, if I speak with people uh, that I work with uh, within our different working groups, uh, there is a family connection from mother to father to son and daughter or within the family. Um, there are some of the students or some of the employees right now in the mineral sectors, uh, they have known our companies during their studies, so they see the opportunity to uh, start immediately a job there. Uh, it is a dynamic sector uh, where one mineral it is used in different uh, applications. And the idea is that you get to know different sectors thanks to the use of minerals in different other sectors. Moving from one specific application, so if you are a market manager in one specific application, moving to another application, it gives you the perspective of changing sector, actually, because it is not exactly the same functionality or the same product ending in that specific sector. Uh, there is a continuous training to boost retention rate, but also to create the possibility to grow professionally. And sometimes people leave, but they also come back uh, within the sectors. There is the um, education within the company and um, there is a special trend within the mineral sector, but I think also other sectors have developed it, that the companies, um, John mentioned something that um, the students are very good, but they cannot do a lot. So the companies, they have realized this. And another factor is also the reduced number of people that go into engineering school or geology or um, other uh, areas related to engineering, which has created the companies to build common curricula with different universities and schools to identify and motivate the talent development. So this has created also future employment opportunities. And there are examples in France, Belgium, Romania. Romania, Scandinavia, that illustrate this joint way of building common programs within school for schools and universities that can deliver a quick job uh, immediately after. 
The training on the job site, um, it is done thanks to the coaching. So as a new employer, you get a buddy or a coach that helps you to settle down in the company. Uh, it uh, introduces you to the company, to your future uh, job and responsibilities. And there is also a continuous training. So every year there is a certain number of hours that um, employees uh, are um, uh, generate in order to create this added value for the new people joining the team. This also creates per se a professional developments. And every year, uh, they, multiple companies, they have uh, multiple trainings in the, in the company for their employees. So um, having said this, this is what is going on right now in the different uh, IMA mineral companies. But um, there is also a need to look forward. What is coming next? So what are the next challenges that we face as a sector? And this can be as a company, but also the fact that you have minerals in going in so many different sectors, you would like to anticipate a bit what the challenges will be coming from the different applications using these minerals. So uh, in this frame and in this light, and also to create this opportunity of anticipating um, vocal educational and training, um, a European project uh, was uh, started uh, named the Skills Alliance for Industrial Symbiosis. And the idea or the scope of this project is to enable and accelerate the uptake of industrial symbiosis focused on energy efficiency as well as uh, industrial symbiosis and to create a cross-sectorial blue print for skills. So within this project where there are eight sectors contributing, notably the chemicals, the steel, engineering, non-ferrous, metals, water, cement, and ceramics, the idea is to create industry-driven and proactive strategy development skills that will assist to a wider uptake of the resource and resource uh, energy efficiency as, as well as boost the industrial symbiosis. Um, another uh, scope or another angle that the project is addressing is to address shortage in uh, future skills, not at one sector level, but at eight industrial sectors in order to see a bit how they can uh, link and how we can build these uh, upcoming skill needs uh, across multiple sectors. Uh, and to also address what are the existing curriculas with the future anticipated needs, qualifications and knowledge. So this is just a bit of a look on the past of the sectors, the present, but also what is coming in the future. I'd like to summarize with a few takeaway messages for you. Um, education is the first step to a job profile and position. However, education per se it is not sufficient. So there is on-site learning and continuous training, which are the success factors in order to create a long retention of employees. Mineral sector transition needs new skills and um, there is this dynamic of job profiles and matching of industrial sector needs, which should be addressed and should be anticipated. And the company action to innovate and motivate employees is related and strongly linked with the long life learning as an opportunity to evolve in the same job position, but also to see other opportunities beyond the same job position. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the challenge it is not only for the mineral sector, it is also for other sectors that are facing exactly the same policy pressure or other uh, pressure from down the value chain. So all of this summarizing a bit what is going on in the mineral sector and how we are actually anticipating with other sectors as well. So uh, this is briefly what I wanted to share with you and I'm open for questions in case you have any, or we can collect them at the end of all presentations. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Aurela. That was a very nice uh, presentation. I, I, one of the things that I felt is that I am a millennial, being almost, I'm going to retire very soon, but looking at the millennial sort of way of getting a job, I passed myself for many jobs before I entered into geological survey. Anyway, um, uh, that but that was very good. I I I I got the message. I think it it, it fits very well with what John Loden says about geoscience and the same sort of. I mean, we are starting to to sort of um, get together very nicely in in this conference. 
uh, in this short course. And I, I am, what I can tell you is that I, I, I am learning a lot. And uh, that is good. Uh, this is because I, I believe on long life learning, first of all. But on the other hand, it's because our speakers are very good. Now, um, I don't know if there are questions there. Let me see. Uh, I don't see any in this chat. So we'll uh, we'll go on um, with the next uh, talk of uh, by Damaris Fernandez. Uh, titled Professionals for a Resource-Efficient, Environmentally Friendly, and Socially Integrated World. And uh, Damaris uh, uh, works in the School of Chemistry at the Trinity College in Dublin. Um, uh, she promotes and also does research in technological and socio-technical areas to bring about solutions aimed at a more sustainable use of mineral resources. Uh, her, uh, her activities in the Trinity College have included designing and implementing the strategies for integration of the knowledge triangle, including upscaling technologies, internalization, and research-driven industry-inspired and socially integrated postgraduate ed education. This is exactly what uh, we have, uh, what Aurela says the, the industry is doing. And also, uh, John Luden said the industry is doing, so she's, she's there, I think. Uh, she led uh, uh, between 2012 and 2014, the Irish Raw Materials Strategy, with, uh, which contributed to the integration of Irish institutions in several key raw materials activities through Europe and Latin America, such as the AIP Raw Materials, AIT Raw Materials, KIC and Eramin. She's currently a member of the Executive Committee of the European Technological Platform in Sustainable Mineral Resources and collaborates with the JRC and AIT Climate on the application of visual methods for the development of social technical solutions to challenge related to regional development, circular economy, and sustainable management of natural resources. Uh, Damaris, por favor, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Now you can listen to me, right? And do you see my screen? Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Both thank things. you. Okay, I'll try to go fast. Um, as Thank you for that very nice introduction and thank you to the other speakers, to John Ludin and Aurela. They were uh, presenting very nicely about uh, their, their views and their sectors. And I, I agree with Manuel, I have been learning a lot also. What I'm trying to do here is um, show you, show to you our experience uh, as a, as a integrator of these three, the, tri the knowledge triangle, academia, research, and also industry. Um, one of the key uh, things that we have seen for almost 10 years now is that the sustainability aspect was already uh, sounding very strongly uh, 10 years ago in terms of what would be the key bottlenecks and the elements that would once solved, provide a successful implementation of any raw materials related project. And we kept seeing uh, now and again that uh, resource efficiency, environmentally friendly projects and socially integrated aspects were required in all of them. So uh, we are in 2020, we need to see that the professionals that we are forming now are going to face a world, as you guys have said, that uh, where, where their world, our world, is changing their paradigms, especially after last year. Uh, so reading the trends, I will just go overview of the, what's been happening a while ago. We don't have a doubt about the role of the raw materials in the development of the society. One example is the use of copper since the onset of electrification, which has, has led to a lot of um, mining activity and the, the society development. We don't have any doubt about the role of the raw materials in supporting the current need for an energy transition, the mobility transition to achieve the climate uh, related targets, right? So as you know, the green technologies require a wide range of raw materials. Therefore, we need to continue mining and also promoting the recycling. But until we achieve those targets, we need we know that we are saying that we will have a lot of mining to go uh, there is no role of, uh, doubt about the role of those raw materials in supporting communications and techno and connectivity and 
when those ba those uh, generations, a couple of decades ago, were talking about increased communication, the communication era, the global village, we started to think, these, these concepts started to sink in, but we have seen the effects currently last year very hard. Uh, these new inputs from the pandemic have uh, halted mobility. They have triggered actions globally, tending to facilitate remote to work, remote education, automated work where possible. Conferences are now online, <laughs> right? We are, we are living that. This has resulted in a demand of high technology related materials and uh, metals and minerals, many of them already included in the cr critical raw materials list in Europe. Uh, also, the, this has made, as a result, uh, refreshed this discussion in society about connectivity and their relation to flexible working modalities, new education models, and city planning. And here I highlight the new education models. Um, the trends that we have seen in the last decade uh, is that the center stakeholders here, that industry related with raw materials, the associations, the research institute and the academia, that cluster was very solid, but there was a rather fast uh, inclusion of further other uh, raw materials. Uh, stakeholders such as the government bodies, the international bodies that gives directives that now could be binding to this other cluster. And we see the participation of NGOs such as the environmental NGOs, but many others as well. And lately the civil society stakeholders sector. Uh, a big, big example, um, what I'm seeing, showing in this, in this table actually is the impact from local to global and darker, darker shade of blue would show where we expect a further or, or a major influence of that particular stakeholder. But with, when we look at the civil society, they not only are expected and acting and impacting in the local realm, but also globally. And this is something that uh, for some uh, sectors has happened quite rapidly. This is one example uh, from August 2018, one single person, young generation started the her own initiative and by one, in, in one year time, she was selected as, as the person of the year by Time uh, magazine. Uh, we know how a good idea can, can um, achieve you know, a, a lot of support, but that also shows that the civil society group of stakeholders participate and uh, are, their voice is listened. Now I'm going to fly with other stakeholders. We know international bodies such as the UN, they're giving our, their directives, associations such as Euro Minds. They also are working towards sustainability, et cetera, for putting their position there. European technology platforms, for instance, and their projects have also for, done foresight work and look at impacting zero impact mining, uh, full automation processes, um, enabling trends that they were, uh, they were foresight, uh, they were, they were uh, projected towards 2050. However, we may see that this is happening or going to happen quite sooner. Research bodies as well, they are looking at sustainability and looking and working with, uh, with society as well. We have uh, the NGOs that we, this is one that is very uh, well known, but there are many. And of course, they have their voice that uh, is working together with the rest of society to facilitate or not projects that they re would regard um, worth of support. We have good practices in Europe. This is one example in this, the circle Arctic. We have another pra good practice 
where there is coexistence, despite you know, overlapping priorities for multiple st stakeholders. This is a um, <clears throat> secondary raw materials example in, in Belgium. And what happens, uh, how we could read uh, the fast and this high impact of the new stakeholders' voice. We have been working with the old uh, way of, of working, but what happens is that we have multiple stakeholders, multiple priorities, different perspectives, which are taught, uh, which are all of them valid enough. So we are working with complex systems. And that means many layers. It doesn't mean that the complex is more complicated. It just means that it's nonlinear. We have to see different layers and perspectives. We cannot see them evolve just as we used to see in a, in a linear system or a linear approach. So this is why sometimes they could evolve very slowly or fast. Um, what does industry say? For instance, industry like a LKAB, they are all set for new, new standards for mining, have uh, less fossil fuels in, 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 their, in their production, have more critical raw materials extracted from their waste. So they are uh, working towards implementation of new technologies and innovations. However, that's, that's also some example from small and medium-sized enterprises where you can find in Europe very good examples of innovations that could support more um, trusted and trustful projects in the, in the eyes of the civil society. However, this doesn't seem to be extremely convincing for some of the stakeholders. Uh, the companies that will be leading, they mostly will aim above and beyond regulations uh, we have due diligence with regards to with regards to health and safety, ethical supply chains, inclusion and diversity. This goes beyond gender balance quota. So here we have uh, companies that are actually including the wide spectrum of gender and also other types of diversity in terms of uh, physical capacity, mobility to to work or not. This is even facilitated by new digital technologies that allow people to work remotely. Uh, the management and monitoring of residues, and of course, again, the communication with community. But here, community is not only the local community surrounding the project. So we have these many layers of community that will voice their concern. So I work, I will go back to the first slide here and say, well, what are the important skills that a professional dealing with all this needs to happen? They have to be enablers or participate on projects that are resource efficient, environmentally friendly, socially integrated, it's because they are currently facing a, a part of them change in the world. So uh, in the last couple of um, slides, I will show uh, how this here, this in, uh, how they, they, they need to manage voices that are positive and negative, regardless of how convincing the, our need for the raw materials is, we also need to see that uh, we have bottlenecks. And here I would just show a a very interesting example. This was a workshop that we developed only among raw materials related people, people that work professionally in the raw materials sector. And we evaluated uh, the raw materials uh, value chain. And what we could see is that as a consumer, uh, the purely technical challenges uh, remained uh, the less difficult area. But the most uh, difficult uh, challenges were related over 50% to societal challenges and definition of actual of what is the actual problem because uh, there were so many layers that it was difficult to pinpoint exactly what would allow a project to go on. Another, um, when you would of act as a part as a as a producer country again or institution again the resources 
lack of resources and societal challenges was the big bottleneck. Again, purely technical challenges was the least difficult area. What this says, and this has come every in, in every complex project that I have we have addressed, is that uh, no, regardless of there is always resources to solve a technical challenge, even if it is now or in certain time. But the difficulty in reality lies on how to deal with social technical challenges. And what we have saw, uh, used is um, in really in collaboration with climate change people teams and also with GRC is uh, the use of social technical and participatory methods. What we have here is people participating and developing together solutions and uh, indicators of success and building roadmaps. This generates useful information. These are conversational space, but we go from quality to semi-quantitative to, or they go to qualitative um, places and uh, they develop indicators as, as, as such. And for this, they are able to uh, by creating mapping of stakeholders, determining the challenges, the needs that are desired, needed to be addressed, uh, visioning desired outcomes uh, for these specific timelines and roadmaps, they can integrate, interact, integrate, create solutions and innovate in terms of technical and non-technical innovations. Uh, this is something that we could, and we can actually uh, uh, teach to our people, uh, our graduate students are receiving modules that, it, that create this. We simulate these systems with them and ultimately they enable trusted systems. So uh, the good point about this is that uh, you can create co-owned monitoring indicators from a qualitative situation. And then with these indicators, you can monitor, control, evaluate, reassign projects and roles as they progress. Uh, lastly, I would say that projects as, such as Intermin, which have this global footprint, uh, have a very large potential to jointly develop curricula that will enable those students to learn and apply participatory methodologies to deal with this kind of things. I am open Thank for- Thank you very much, uh, Damaris. Uh, yes, uh, um, I, I, I think that uh, obviously uh, th those things that you were mentioned, probably they teach in the Trinity College, but I don't see that many schools in the world are training geologists to do what you said they have to do step by looking for the raw material first but then obviously these are the new things that we have to look for it's only one minute left uh, but i will present i, I don't know uh, if we have some more time if not i will i will uh, present uh, very quickly intermin that you uh, so kindly in, uh, introduced um, as you all probably know uh, it's uh, it's um, uh, a specialized portal of global raw materials training. The, the idea here is uh, to to present to a student that wants to to uh, to find the, the, the right postgraduate training all around the world, the best postgraduate training all around the world, including what Damaris said, uh, the, the new the new things that geologists or mine engineers should know. You can look around in this portal and find it, and maybe it's, it's online. You could. Uh, you could do it. This, that's why we are, the first thing we've done is, uh, is to map skills and knowledge uh, knowledge in the EU and third countries in all the training courses that we already have in the portal. We have identified the knowledge gaps and emerging needs. And this conference is, is a proof that uh, Aurelia has explained us uh, some of the knowledge gaps and the emerging needs and that is also. Even uh, John Luden said what, what the, the common geologists should change the uh, the, the people should change the view of geologists and turn and, and, and change what they think about geologists so geologists can, can cover all those skills. And then they, we also, um, uh, uh, we have developed common metrics and reference points to, for quality assurance of recognition of training, and this will be implemented in the port, portal. Uh, we have developed a comprehensive competency model for the employment across the primary and secondary raw material sector. We are now establishing common training programs in the raw material sector. 
uh, I, I remember that Aurela said this thing that some of the policies of the Commission had helped uh, in, in what was, uh, for example, the Erasmus program has helped in this change of roles or ways of learning and skills acquiring, and this is true. We are trying to do something like that, a, 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 a changer somehow. And of course, we are now creating this international network of training centers for professionals in the raw materials sectors that is so much need. Uh, the, the, the consortium groups, professionals, training and education organizations, employers, mostly geological service, and our advisory board covers all around the world. So we, our global audiences, uh, half a million professionals from all around the world. The competence model is very interesting because here you can see that uh, we have already defined the things that uh, create a professional. It's the personal competences. Yes, they're academic competences, but this is not all. Then you, 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 you have to get the workplace competences and competences on a wide uh, industry-wide technical competences industrial sector technical competences. And then one thing that is sometimes forgotten is that a geologist or a mining engineer might reach the, the leading part in the company and he has to have some management competences. We have designed this and found and made a skill map that nobody has ever made. This is the way we are, we are working. And this is, for example, for materials engineers and recycling, qualification from the university, knowledge acquired, the skills acquired, this is the very important, John Luden said, uh, uh, Aurela also, uh, skills. It's a skills matter. You must know to do th you how to do things, not only keeping your, all that knowledge, that fantastic knowledge. No, no, you have to do some, something. Otherwise, the company is not interested in you. And then, of course, those skills have to, co co to have competence. You have to do the job with competence. Uh, you acquire that competence by knowing these skills. This, this is the same model for mineral exploration, mineral extraction. This is all, you can download this uh, from our website in, in the inter intermin website. But the most important thing that we have done so far is the intermin portal. And then the inter intermin portal works on this way. We have courses providers that can access the portal and put their training courses. We have students and professionals that can access the portal and find the right skills they, they might need and then uh, go for those training all around the world. Of course, employers can check that because also Damari said that, that I think uh, Damari said that uh, employers should know uh, what, what is available. So Aurela also said that, what is available to know how they, the training they need. So uh, this portal is also for employers because all the skills are there. We have designed these learning platforms and well, this is the IT uh, and this is the way it looks. Uh, if you try Intermin, uh, portal, you will find this this web. Today we have uh, 360. This is old, but this is training centers uh, from 100, almost 100 countries. Um, well, the, you can explore institutions. You can uh, store, uh, study programs. Uh, you can, if you are a university or a training center or the AIT, you can join the Intermin network. The the student or the university can explore what we have, select the study area, business, this is how we did it. This is the groups, mining methods, mining uh, services, mining geochemical, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, once you have selected what you want, the, the system finds the programs that must match your interest. And so with a simple search, you will find what you want. And this is not easy because normally you will go to your university, but then it's, com it's complicated to find that those, those particular training courses that you're looking for. Uh, the, the, the system ranks the programs by areas. Uh, how much of, of these uh, areas of SUS areas uh, has that particular training program? So you can see how balanced is it. Uh, you can also check by geographical location. This is uh, an, an image. And find the university by uh, the, the website gets you the university you finally decide to look for. Uh, we have also uh, joined efforts with another program, a, a project called Guide that includes all the bachelor and master offers by universities. Intermin is global, Guide is European. And so to uh, summar, summar, summarize, uh, we are going to 
maintain and establish a, a strong and a sustainable relationship with the leading raw materials training institutions in all the relevant countries. We, uh, with this, we will try to increase the competence and expertise in the field of primary and secondary raw materials of EU postgraduates. This is this is missing. We 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 are looking for new skills. People have to be trained on these new skills. Uh, long long li lifelong training is a, is a need. You you have to learn all your life, and then this tool will allow you to to find the best skills that you might need when you change from one job to another. As Aurela said, that has happened in the past. This will improve the availability. Another big problem and of qualifying skilled workforce in the uh, with that will lead to for the EU to be more competitive in the raw materials in, industry. Uh, the, the the project also uh, will enhance cross sectoral innovation. This is something very important. I think uh, uh, both John Luden and, and Aurela mentioned this thing of of, of the new link between the institute and universities and. Uh, and and uh, and the industry and also between industries to 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 cope with the needs of today's uh, uh, industry production. Intermin, of course, will foster international cooperation and we will uh, generate a long-lasting network of technical and vocational training centers for raw materials professionals. Um, we have a, an, an official video. I, I don't know if we have time to see. It's a very short video. But anyway, uh, this is the link. If you are interested, one of those who are watching us. Uh, if not, uh, because we are over the uh, already over the over time, I don't know if we can say something else. Uh, there is uh, some. Uh, John is saying that we can produce a. Yeah, yeah, we can do that. Thank you, uh, John. Uh, I don't see any question. I don't say. I don't know if from Egu there is any question anywhere. If not, uh, then um, I, I have to summarize that this has been a very interlocked sort of uh, short course because all the things said by John were then uh, locked by Aurelia and finish, finis, finalized uh, uh, in, in the end uh, by Damari. So uh, I think we are on the same route, uh, geoscience, raw materials, the training companies, the, the training institutions, the industry, that needs all this, and and and, and the Damaris particular said a new skill that we should have is how to cope with the people saying no. Uh, the other day, uh, um, a mayor from here in Spain, in in an area where there are some feldspar, um, they they the, the mining uh, uh, officer went to talk to them to explain that that the operation was going to be very small, that no harm done, but the people said that we do not want. Big, small, nothing. So how can you can you cope with? We want nothing from you from the mining industry. And this this is, uh, I think, in my opinion, the, the 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 reason why geologists and mining engineers, the first one to arrive in an area, have to already have the message, and they have to learn this message, uh, how to cope with this the the problem of the the social uh, license. Uh, and this is something uh, I think that it deals with skills and the, the need of uh, these uh, new skills that are not yet trained, I don't know in Trinity School, but in general in the uh, geological schools or in the faculties or in the mining schools, nobody is dealing with social license to operate and training their postgraduate graduates with these things. And this is basically a big problem. Although as if you enter Intermin, you will see that there are some places where you can learn about these things and obviously thanks also to this short course uh, i don't know if someone of you want some of you want to say something uh or you are happy with your, what you heard if uh, if not uh i will just thank all the speakers uh, the attendance if there were any i don't know and um and uh and thanks uh, ego again for organizing this short course uh, I, as you know the the short course is, go is going to be taped and I think if you send uh, to Edo your service the the presentations, we can also make some more uh, diffusion through the inter intermin portal. And of course, uh, uh, if John wants uh, us to write a paper on all this that we heard today, I think it would be a good idea with uh, with uh, with Aurela, Damaris, and John uh, a paper on 
or to, to focus their problem of, of skills uh, in this particular side of the business that is not related with particularly with the science of with uh, with the science of geology or, or mining, but with the science of sociology. And I don't know if we're ready to, to cope with sociology these days. Manuel, my suggestion was that we that the Intermin tries to find a way of publishing the you know the results of what we just did. You know, in you know maybe as videos, maybe with some text as well. I, I'm not. I, I don't believe in writing papers. I did that when I was a kid. I stopped doing that now. But it's. Uh, <laughs> but, but but we need to make sure that, you know because there was you know there were a series of good talks that that actually there wasn't much of an audience if anything that we need to get out there I think so it's an opportunity yeah. seeing, as we, seeing as how we prepared this stuff to try and badge it together somehow put it together and and so people can see it, that's all right that's fantastic we are going to do that and I think it's a good idea we have uh, we, the project is still lasting till September. Uh, so we have some time, but uh, but we will now make a, 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 a proposal to all of you, so we can uh, write something, include the videos, and include also the include also the the, the the presentations, and write something on the conclusions of each of you, which is I think uh, the most important thing. So thank you very much to all the attendants and all the presenters and the organization, and I, I think I can close the the, the, the short course and. and I hope you keep yourself in good health. John, is that a painting of you that I'm watching? <laughs> because you have a paint, uh, an oil painting in the back. You, you, yeah, you, 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 your is off. You, your micro is off. John, you're muted. I'm saying it's a painting of the view from where I am sitting in France. Oh, nice. Okay. Although I'm not supposed to be Let in France. Let me see. I have really. something on. Okay. Okay. So uh, thank, you, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. And thank you to everybody. Bye.